back with and this video is part two. I'm continuing my discussions on this paper that has recently just come out called How Do Intermittency and Simultaneous Processes Obfuscate the Arctic Influence on Mid-Latitude Winter Extreme Weather Events? So often and for many years I've talked about the rapidly warming Arctic and how that Arctic amplification effect um, you know, the, um, why the warming in the Arctic is so much greater than the rest of the planet, how that um, greatly affects the jet streams. It slows the jet streams and makes them wavier, makes them wavier in the north-south direction, and that is a direct, directly causing um, an increase in the frequency, severity, and duration of extreme weather events, and these extreme weather events are happening in regions um, where they never happened before. Okay, so there's huge uh, changes um, in, in weather patterns and the statistics of weather that we had in a so-called stationary climate uh, no longer exists in our present situation of abrupt climate system change. So I'm going through uh, this paper because it talks about um, it, it sort of reviews um, some of the work on the connections of the Arctic to mid-latitude weather events. And there's 146 papers on the subject fairly recently. And there's not a lot of um, agreement um, among them. Some of them very strongly uh, show the Arctic temperature amplification to the... Um, extreme weather events, but other ones are not finding it with the models and so on. But I think from a top level view of the whole system, you know, if you look at why the jet streams exist, then clearly when you get massive changes in the Arctic, massive uh, temperature increases, you get massive pressure increases, and that has to change the, the jet streams. But I think, um, you know, there's something uh, missing in a lot of these, a lot of these studies, I think you know it'll it'll pop out at the end the the huge connection to the Arctic. But there's a lot of other things that are affecting it, and they're trying to uh, say it's it's uh, internal variability, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just talking about some of those regions. Um, and one of the things that the, is that the weather linkages to the Arctic, um, you know, they don't appear. These connections don't appear in all years or all months. So there's a bit of an intermittency. Sometimes they're swamped out by other things. But I think as we lose more and more Arctic sea ice, you know, as we go to a blue ocean event, we're going to see, you know, much more consistency in these extreme weather event patterns that, that are occurring. Right now, this, the whole system is going through this uh, tipping point of abrupt change, and we're seeing a lot of fluctuation and a lot of noise and a lot of complexity. So there's a lot of year-to-year -year variability uh, reported in studies claiming weak multi-decadal trends and linkages. Um, and it says amplified Arctic warming may not initiate mid-latitude connections, but instead intensify intrinsic linkages by enhancing the amplitude of existing large-scale Rossby waves, subject to the influences of sea surface temperature, anomaly patterns, and geographic features. So. One of the things um, is that as the jet streams become much more fractured and broken, um, they're more affected by regional effects like land ocean contrast, for example. So that's what this is getting at, um, comparing the sea surface temperatures to the adjacent land temperatures and how that varies from different times of years and different seasons. And the, um, the overall anomaly patterns and geographic features uh, you know, which the geographic features affect, you know, where the land and ocean is and where the, the Rossby waves will be. And they, so they contribute to the formation of these stationary blocking anticyclones. Um, so blocked weather patterns. Um, amplified Rossby waves lead to increased northward warm invection. So if you amplify the Rossby wave and it extends far further north, for example, the, the ridge, then you get a lot of warm air, warm humid air from the south moving up into the ridge, right up into the Arctic even in the middle of winter, you know, the dark winter. 
and you get southward cold advection. So you get the cold Arctic air breaking out and going far south. Um, so you can measure uh, the jet stream waviness in various metrics, sinu sinuosity, meridional circulation index, local wave activity flux, and the even, these um, measurements have indicated an increased frequency of high amplitude jet stream days since Arctic amplification emerged in the mid 90s, embedded within large year to year uh, variability. Okay, uh, because cold and warm extreme events often occur simultaneously in adjacent regions, right? And that's because, you know, in the ridge of the jet stream, it's super warm, and in the trough of the jet stream, it's super cold. And, uh, you know, these jet stream waves progress, okay, as they can move, um, they carry that weather with them. So you get weather whiplashing between the cold and warm region. You can get a very warm region going to very cold, going to very warm. You know, just look at what happened in Europe recently. Record warm temperatures one week, they were in a strong ridge. Record cold temperatures the next week, they were in a strong trough. And that's very harmful to infrastructure. It's very harmful to ecosystems. For example, the trees and vegetation um, have buds popping out with the very warm weather much earlier than normal. And then the cold weather the next week killed them off. And that will greatly reduce, you know, that's caused tremendous damage to, for example, the wine growing regions in Europe, this, this most recent, recent event. So they talk about some feedbacks to once you get these these long wave atmospheric patterns, these Rosby waves set up, jet streams set up, you get Arctic processes feeding back. So you get local thermodynamic surface heating. So local heating in the Arctic. Um, you know, if you have a ridge going up into the Arctic, you get local heating there, and that can uh, amplify the the ridge and keep it persistently there. Um, that's often associated with loss of sea ice, and we're getting more sea ice loss in some regions than in other regions. You get northward air invection, air advection into an existing long wave ridge. Okay, so any, any, when you have wavier jet streams, in the ridges you get warm air, warm humid air moving south up into the Arctic. And in the troughs you get cold Arctic air moving south. Both of those mechanisms Will, will amplify and increase Arctic warming, right? If you move warm air north, obviously it's warming the Arctic. If you move a lot of the Arctic cold air south, then it's displaced by warmer air, and that's also greatly warming the Arctic. And then you can also get atmospheric blocking processes, um, you know, the persistent jet stream um, blocking um, that, that uh, you know, uh, cause persistent weather patterns. So there, there's, uh, you know, formulas to describe all of these mechanisms, and I'm not going to go into the uh, into those. I wanted to show some some of the highlights of this paper. So I don't like that their their maps are upside down. I mean, Greenland down here is what we normally see. I don't know why they switched it around here. So this is upside. Greenland's here. So look, you know, just turn your head upside down and have a look at it if you want, or invert it. I mean, that's what I'm so used to. But anyway, we've got the, um, the uh, this is the Brent Kara Sea. So what it, this is showing November sea ice concentration in the period 1979 to 2019, the change. So, you know, the drop here, the percent per decade is here, down 20% per decade is these dark blue areas. So this is the sea ice concentration loss. So it's greatest in these regions here, in the Brent Kara Sea and in the Chukchi, uh, Beaufort Sea area, and also in Baffin Bay, but not so much in Baffin Bay. Okay, so the sea ice is the sea ice concentration is greatly reduced there, and this is in November. So we, you know, we've passed the melt, the uh, mid-September minimum, and the ice is growing back, and there's still there's a lot of it missing here that used to be there, and there's connections between these um, the loss of sea ice here and certain jet stream patterns that set up. And then this leads to uh, sort of uh, connections, teleconnections. So the delay of fall freeze up of sea ice is one of the most conspicuous manifestations of the changing Arctic. It occurs regionally with the largest changes in um, the uh, uh, Barent Kara Sea, Baffin Bay, and the Chukchi Beaufort Seas. 
okay? Um, and uh, during the later winter, when the Arctic Ocean is generally frozen over, then there's less uh, effects from the sea ice, but then we get um, uh, stratospheric polar vortex changes. The stratospheric polar vortex can also be uh, split and chopped in two, and that can lead to very, very cold outbreaks over continents and extreme cold and also uh, lots of snowfall. So those things are happening. So there's differences between early and late winter processes that are involved in the Arctic. If you're looking at the Arctic to mid-latitude extreme weather links, you need to consider the different times carefully. You know, fall, early winter, late winter, and so on, okay, because the effects uh, come in. Now, what we're seeing here is if we look at, um, this is winter, um, this is winter, January, February effects, for example. So we're talking about the stratospheric polar vortex. We've got a strong polar vortex here. Now, this, this is a graph from 1980 to, to, to um, 1979 to 2018, and it shows the frequency of occurrence of, 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 of this sort of situation. So what we're seeing is we're seeing in, late, in, in recent years, we've had a drop off of this type of cluster. This happens 15% of the time, but it's happening less and less frequently. This happens, this is happening, uh, you know, um, solidly still happening or with more frequency, this type of cluster where the polar vortex is weaker and it's displaced off center. Notice how it's displaced towards Greenland. And I've talked about, you know, uh, will the uh, cold air just circ the center of cold will be the center of Greenland and, you know, this cluster is becoming more prevalent and uh, maybe that's indicating that this is happening. Um, cluster three, you get it warmer here and colder here. Cluster four, warmer over here, colder here. And then cluster five, warm over the whole Arctic. So you can see, uh, you know, how these clusters, how these type of patterns are happening with the stratospheric polar vortex. Now, of course, there's linkages to Asia. There's something, a uh, term they use is warm Arctic cold Eurasia. And often what we're seeing is that when there is very, very low sea ice in the Barent Kara Sea and also in the Central Arctic Ocean, that will set up the jet stream patterns such that we get extremely cold uh, Eurasia uh, patterns. Okay, so this is warm Arctic cold continent. Um, so that's a connection. Um, in the early winter, uh, you know, the, the early winter, you know, it's these, it's the loss of the sea ice in these regions that, that feeds back into the effect. So this just shows you the sea ice concentration um, is the, uh, you know, so, so this is time variation of the mean sea ice concentration anomaly over the Brent Kara Sea. That's the black line. Okay, so when sea ice is low, the, uh, the warm Arctic uh, cold Eurasia index, which means, you know, the Arctic is very warm, Eurasia is very cold, and this happens here. Look at this very strong uh, case of the index when the sea ice is very, very low, and here the sea ice is low and it's very strong again. Okay, this, this warm Arctic cold Eurasia. So you can do correlations and see the kind of patterns that, that are affected. Um, and there's lots of different data in here. Um, I'm not going to go into all of the details. Um, it's, it's a tough paper to wade through, but the stratospheric polar vortex is in the late winter uh, pathway that, um, that, that basically disrupts weather patterns. Um, so we, we get cold weather outbreaks um, in, in different places when the, the, the stratospheric polar vortex breaks and there's sudden stratospheric warming. Okay, so there's lots of other uh, figures and details. Um, here you can relate the surface air temperature in the uh, Barent Kara Sea um, to the, the sea ice amount. Sea ice is low, surface temperature is much higher. Okay, and there's more and more, there's, there's more data here. But the basic, uh, the, so the basic point I want to get at is, is, you know, it's not there's lot, basically there's been 146 papers um, on, on uh, looking at the connections of the Arctic amplification to the extreme weather event. And there's a lot of complexity, but I keep in mind the fundamental um, things that I've talked about connecting the Arctic 
to uh, extreme weather events. Thank you for listening.